Headlines. The U.N. Security Council adopts North Korea's human rights abuse as an agenda item for the first time in an 11-2 vote with China and Russia voting against the idea as expected. Fitch rating says Korea has room left for more rate cuts while adding that the country does not have to worry about deflationary pressure for now. We give you an exclusive with the ratings agency. And Pope Francis criticizes Vatican bureaucracy, saying a church that doesn't try to improve is like a sick body. Hello and welcome to Adira News. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Chedi. The United Nations Security Council has decided to put North Korea's human rights violations on its agenda. And that means the topic can be brought up any time when deemed necessary for the next three years. China and Russia, meanwhile, were the only two countries that voted against this move. Connelly starts us off. It's official. North Korea's human rights issues are now part of the UN Security Council's agenda. The DPRK is in effect a totalitarian state which uses violence and repression against its own citizens to maintain itself. The regime's atrocities against its own people have created an inherently unstable state. Members of the council voted on Monday to formally take up the issue of Pyongyang's alleged human rights abuses. This despite objections from China and Russia. However, there are no vetoes in procedural votes, like this one, where an agenda is being set, so the other members were able to override the objections. This is the first time that the top UN body has taken up North Korea's human rights issues. Previously, discussions on Pyongyang were solely centered on the North's nuclear weapons program, but now all aspects of the country will be monitored and discussed. The latest ruling could also serve as a prelude to punitive measures against Pyongyang in the future, as it comes a matter of days after the UN General Assembly voted in favor of referring North Korea to the International Criminal Court for alleged crimes against humanity. North Korea, which has refused to cooperate at every step, quickly denounced the decision. Monday's report follows a stinging U.N. report released in February that said North Koreans face unspeakable atrocities. These include forced labor in the country's prison camps, deliberate starvation, executions and torture. This latest move ramps up international pressure on Pyongyang to finally treat its own people better. Connie Lee, Arirang News. North Korea's internet, meanwhile, was unplugged for about 10 years, 10 hours, that is, on this Tuesday, although it's partially back online now. Some speculate to Washington's involvement in this after the recent hacking attack on Sony Pictures. Our Shin Zemin has more. We will respond. Uh, we will respond proportionally and we'll respond uh, in a place and time uh, and manner that we choose. Days after U.S. President Barack Obama said he would take proportional measures against the cyber attack on Sony Pictures that's been blamed on North Korea, the communist state experienced its worst network collapse in years. North Korea has since gained full access to the Internet, but only after 10 hours of disruptions. It's not yet clear what caused the outage. But suspicion immediately turned to the United States in light of the recent attack on Sony Pictures. Deputy spokesperson for the U.S. State Department Marie Harf declined to comment on the reports that North Korea had lost its Internet access, but did say that as the U.S. implements its responses, some will be seen and some may not be seen. Access to the Internet is limited in the North, and what is offered comes from a Chinese-run provider. Only a small number of people are allowed online, and very little commercial or government-related business is done on the web. For that reason, experts say the outage isn't expected to have any lasting economic effects on the North. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, China, on its part, has warned against foreign press accusing Beijing of hacking into North Korea's Internet networks. China's foreign ministry says that reports indicating any involvement on the part of Beijing are false and purely speculative. Regarding the Sony hacking incident, the ministry says it's keeping a close eye on both Pyongyang and Washington and called on both parties to resolve matters through dialogue. 
The South Korean government is blocking an opposition lawmaker from traveling to the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex tomorrow. The Unification Ministry says it rejected Representative Park Ji-won's request to visit the site because he already visited North Korea twice over the last two months. He was formally invited by Kim Yang-gun, North Korea's top official for inter-Korean issues, along with a dozen other South Korean delegates. Hyundai Group Chairwoman Hyun jung un was also invited. Lawmaker Park was the only person whose request was rejected by the government. South Korea's cyber crisis alert level was elevated by one notch to the third highest on a scale of five this morning. This as President Park Geun-hye urged authorities at a cabinet meeting to thoroughly investigate the alleged hacking of a computer system at the state-run nuclear power plant operator. The hacker or a group of hackers that claims to have gained access to the power plant's network released another set of documents online. Earlier today. This is the fifth such leak since the first last week. As for North Korea's alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures, President Park urged officials to inspect Seoul's ability to counter cyber terrorism. Our alarm bells for the Korean economy have been going off for months now, with many experts calling for structural reforms across the board. And our Kim ji reports on how next year, 2015, could be the golden year for the government to forge ahead with those changes to breathe new life into the economy. Next year is a golden time to carry out structural reforms of the Korean economy. This is what Finance Minister Che Gyo-an had in mind when he laid out a set of comprehensive economic policy directions this week. There are no nationwide elections scheduled for next year, meaning that the Park Geun-hye administration can focus less on wooing voters and more on implementing changes. Developing the employment system is regarded as an integral part of the structural reforms. Trey has stated before that local companies are reluctant to hire employees for permanent positions because it's not easy to lay people off once they're hired. The number of temporary positions has reached an all-time high, with official figures estimating the number at more than 6 million this year. Those recruited for temporary positions face job insecurity and lower pay compared to their permanent counterparts, even though they may be doing the same exact work. The need for structural reforms is in the spotlight amid dismal forecasts for our Korean economy, battling low growth and a shrinking workforce. A study by the Korea Development Institute shows that the potential growth rate of 3.6 percent will drop to 2.7 percent between years 2021 to 2030 and tumble to the 1 percent range starting in 2031. The state-run think tank attributes that to Korea's aging society as the number of workers aged between 15 to 64 is thinning. Korea has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. The U.S. Central Intelligence Agency's World Factbook has a total fertility rate at 1.25, placing it in 219th place among the 224 countries surveyed. The problem is compounded by the growing number of job seekers who are part of the 7 million strong baby boom generation who are now starting to exit the labor market in mass numbers. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Fitch Ratings says Korea has more room left for key rate cuts, so while adding that Korea does not have to worry about deflationary pressure for now. Our Hwang Jie spoke to chief analyst for Asia-Pacific sovereigns at Fitch Ratings, Andrew Kohun. Take a look. So, Andrew, many here in Korea are drawing parallels between Korea and Japan, saying that Korea is close to the kind of slow growth and falling prices that its neighbors suffered from for two decades. Do you also agree with the comparison? I think that comparison is uh, rather overdone. Uh, we expect Korea's economy to grow about 3.7 percent this year, uh, rising to 3.9 percent next year. And there are plenty of countries in the world that would be uh, very happy 
to be growing at those kinds of rates. Mm. Um, I think there's a risk of uh, some months of, of negative price changes next year, uh, partly as a result of the decrease in oil prices. But for an energy importing country like Korea, lower oil prices um, and perhaps even a temporary or mild deflation uh, might not be such a bad thing. So what should Korea focus more on, longer term sustainable growth or boosting the short term recovery momentum? Well, it's not for us as a ratings agency to give policy advice, so that's an important point for us to stress. Um, I think from our perspective, what I'd say is that Korea's degree or scope for policy flexibility, both on the monetary and on the fiscal side, is a strength in the credit profile. So compared to some of Korea's high income advanced economy peers, the central bank has room to, to cut interest rates. Public debt is moderate, so the authorities have scope to uh, use the budget to assist in economic management, uh, more than is the case in many of the country's high income peers. Now, household debt, that is one of the major risks of the Korean economy. Could that possibly develop into a crisis that could threaten the stability of the country's financial industry? Well, Korea does have quite a high degree of household debt compared to its peers, so roughly 90% of GDP in household debt, uh, which is higher now than the US. Well, I think that um, how I view household debt is as something that uh, decreases the economy's resilience to a significant negative shock if one were to materialize. So from that point of view, it's something that weighs on the credit profile, weighs on the ratings. And what risks could there be when, actually, when the Fed actually starts to uh, raise its key interest rate? Uh, thinking about financial market behavior, um, Investors have tended to treat Korea as more of a safe haven. What I'm saying is that we don't view U.S. monetary policy tightening as a risk for Korea in the same way as it is for some other um, countries in the Asia-Pacific region. All right, uh, that was the Fitch Ratings' Andrew Kohun there. And moving on to the latest development from Korean Air's nut rage incident, prosecutors plan to request a provisional arrest warrant for Cho hyun the former vice president of the country's flagship carrier. They say this will happen tomorrow. She's facing charges of violating a number of aviation security laws, as well as allowing her aides to water down the scale of this incident and tamper with evidence. Cho was thrust into spotlight early this month after making a soul-bound Korean Air flight turn back to the gate after getting upset that a flight attendant did not serve macadamia nuts, according to protocol. She is the eldest daughter of the airline's CEO, Cho Yang-ho. While the film industry here in Korea thrives, the competition within grows fears. That said, Korea's regulatory authority has slapped millions of dollars in fines on two of Korea's biggest movie chains for unfair practices. Our Connie Kim reports. Korea's two biggest movie chains, CGV and Lotte Cinema, have been fined a combined 5 million U.S. dollars for engaging in unfair practices. These practices include giving affiliate distributors more screens to show their movies and allowing them to screen the films for longer periods of time. The Fair Trade Commission said the moves gave CJCGV and Lotte Cinema an unfair advantage at the box office. The FTC pointed to two hits in particular, CJ ENM's Masquerade, a 2012 film that attracted more than 10 million viewers, and Lotte Entertainment's The Taste of Money, which was released that same year on triple the number of screens than competing films. The watchdog said the two movie chains also gave out free movie discount coupons without the consent of distributors. It's meaningful because the commission is taking strong legal action for the first time against the unfair practices of large vertical integrated cinema chains. Following up on the fines, the culture ministry says it'll more closely monitor the screening practices of Korean movie chains to ensure that no benefits are being handed down to affiliates. The case has put the oligopoly of the Korean film industry back in the spotlight. The top three multiplexes in Korea make up more than 90 percent of screen shares in the country. And about 30 percent of all films produced each year aren't even released in theaters. 
Experts say a new platform for independent, low-budget films is needed for diversification. I think it is a great idea for major companies to build theaters only for smaller films, but not if it's a merely a temporary measure to avoid the separation between distribution and screening. And market watchers say if these theaters reserved for small firms are given enough support, a positive synergy effect in the industry can be created. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Breaking the 100 million admission mark used to be a dream goal for the Korean film industry, but now it's not so far-fetched. More than 100 million tickets have been sold this year for the third year in a row. Our Park Ji-won has this report. More than 100 million tickets have been sold for Korean films at cinemas this year, marking the third straight year of achieving the milestone. I came to see the Korean film Ode to My Family, which is currently number one at the box office. I'm proud that in terms of special effects, plots and visual themes, I feel that Korean films now are as good as foreign films. Last year, the number of people buying tickets for domestically produced films exceeded the 100 million mark in early October. This year, it took a couple more months to reach the mark. Korean films got off to a relatively slow start this year, especially compared to Hollywood blockbuster releases such as the latest Transformers movie and the seventh installment of the X-Men movies. However, the tide started to turn as we got further into 2014 with the opening of the period action film The Admiral Roaring Currents. The film recorded more than 17 million ticket sales over the summer, a record for a Korean film in Korea. Another Korean action film, The Pirates, was also an overwhelming success, selling more than 8 million tickets. Last year, we had several Korean films attracting 3 to 4 million viewers. But this year, the Admiral Roaring Currents achieved that figure on its own. 2014 has been marked by the success of a small handful of films, pushing us to the 100 million mark. The popularity of Korean films is continuing into December as well, with the heart-wrenching drama set during the Korean War, Ode to My Family, and the documentary film My Love, Don't Cross That River. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Pope Francis has launched a scathing critique of a bureaucracy in the Vatican, saying it's been infected with, quote, spiritual Alzheimer's and the terrorism of gossip. To tell us more, Paul Lee is joining us from the News Center. Paul, uh, Pope Francis has been on a mission to reform the Roman uh, Catholic Church since he was uh, first elected last year. What other tough words did he have to offer? Well, during his annual Christmas meeting, Pope Francis delivered a remarkably blunt speech. He accused some senior Vatican clerics of using their careers to seize power and money while stressing the need for things to change and improve. But some see the pontiff's latest comments as a sign that he's being met with opposition from within the church. Archie Mengil has more. Pope Francis has offered up a blistering critique on the cardinals, bishops and priests who run the Curia, the central administration of the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope said some of the church's bureaucrats were infected with 15 ailments, as he called them headlined by gossip. Gossip is a serious disease that starts with a trap and grabs the whole person. It is the sickness of the cowards who, not having enough courage to speak directly, speak behind people's backs. Pope Francis also called out power-hungry clerics who he said will kill the reputation of their colleagues and brothers in cold blood for their own greed or success. He said some were suffering from spiritual Alzheimer's and that they forgot what first brought them into the priesthood. To cure the ails that plague the church, the Pope called for reforms. A curia that does not do any self-criticism, that does not renew itself, and does not try to improve itself is a sick body. The Pope is hoping to use cardinal advisors he has appointed to fight corruption and poor management within the church.
Part of the reforms may include reining in the curia's power, which has been concentrated in Rome for centuries, giving bishops around the world a bigger say in Roman Catholic Church doctrine. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. And another story, a New York City mayor, Bill de Blasio, has called for unity in the wake of the recent deaths of two police officers who were gunned down in their squad car. And um, he's uh, taking pretty heavy criticism these days for allegedly not doing enough to protect law enforcement personnel following the Michael Brown and Eric Garner cases. Right, he's definitely been under fire from the public after the shocking incidents. In an effort to ease tensions, he's asked for all protests against police violence to be suspended until after the funerals of the two slain policemen. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio made the statement at a press conference on Monday. He's asked people to put aside politics and support the families of the two officers who were killed on Saturday in Brooklyn. And we have to understand the attack on them was an attack on all of us. It was an attack on our democracy. It was an attack on our values. It was an attack on every single New Yorker. And we have to see it as such. As for the case that happened over the weekend, an investigation into the motive of the suspect, Ismail Brinsley, is ongoing. Police Commissioner William Bratton says Brinsley acted alone and that he was full of anti-government and anti-police sentiment. And uh, turning to China, Paul, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping is continuing with his campaign to root out state corruption in the country, and this time targeting a top advisor to the former president, Hu Jintao. That's right. The ruling Communist Party's anti-corruption watchdog has launched a probe into Ling Shihua. For the details are scarce at this point, but the agency did reveal that he was being investigated for, quote, an unspecified disciplinary violation. Ling, who was virtually the chief of staff of the former president, came into the spotlight more than two years ago when he tried to cover up a scandal involving his son who died in a speed car accident. And speculation about his fate ran high after the announcement of a probe into his two brothers back in June. Authorities have intensified their campaign to tackle corruption among officials since Xi Jinping took office with several senior government figures and state company executives now in detention. Mm. And finally, uh, lucky ticket holders in Spain are jumping up and down with joy as they are celebrating their massive winnings in the country's premier lottery. Uh, give us the details. Well, the so-called El Gordo lottery is the largest in the world in terms of overall payouts, which when combined is worth some three billion U.S. dollars. The drawing is this year was so large that it took over four hours to complete on Monday. Thousands were able to claim prizes, but more than 100 people who hit the main jackpot were based in the capital, Madrid. Many of the top winners were beyond disbelief when they saw the final numbers, while others erupted in celebration. My mother is foreign, and the first thing I want to do is bring my grandmother here. She's from Equatorial Guinea. I don't know what else to say, that I'm so happy. The El Gordo Lottery is the world's second lar longest rather running of its kind. The Spanish lottery was first designed in 1812 to allow as many people as possible to receive a festive landfall for the holidays. Charity? Well, truly a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays for them. All right, uh, let's leave it there for now. Paul, thank you so much for those updates, and we'll see you again in just about two hours. And welcome everyone, I'm Kim Bo Kyung with the weather updates. Well, it looks like we are finally getting a break from the recent cold snap. Today's daytime high here in Seoul jumped to 5 degrees, which is about 4 degrees higher compared to yesterday. And at the moment, we are under cloudy skies nationwide. Also, dry weather advisories continue to be in effect for parts of Gangwon-do and Gyeongsang-do provinces. 
Christmas is just around the corner, and it looks like light snow may fall in the central regions early tomorrow morning, but it won't be enough for us to enjoy a white Christmas. Other than that, moderate numbers will continue to stick around through the end of the week. Here are the readings for tomorrow. Seoul makes it to 5, while Busan jumps to 12. On to other places, Daejeon reaches 7, while Jeju makes it to 12. Those are the updates I have for you now. I'll see you soon. And that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.